So I'm not only going to take you to Mars, we're going to come back, because that's the challenge. So let me start off with that little girl from Brooklyn, New York. Yeah, in 1969, a parent brought a television to school, a little black and white, and us little first graders crowded around that TV to watch the Apollo 12 mission. I mean, think about that. It was so impactful. It brought in my horizons as a little girl growing up in New York in the Brooklyn hood, and it helped to plant that seed for thinking about space travel. Now, of course, there are lots of other influences, right? You guys are familiar with the Jetsons, Flash Gordon. I remember coming home in the afternoon and running to see Lost in Space. Warning, Will Robinson. Remember that robot? Yeah. And Dr. Smith, of course. And then later, as a preteen, I got my first taste of Star Wars. I remember running out the theater like this. Oh my gosh, avoiding TIE fighters, right? I was not going to the dark side. And so I really think that those influences helped to inspire things that I did in research at MIT and later at Howard University. And an opportunity to train me as an aerospace engineer and rocket scientist. Um, it fueled my desire to explore space. And for me, it's always been not a question of if we would go to Mars, but when would we go to Mars? So me personally, I was ecstatic when our President Obama said, by 2030s, we're going to go not only go to Mars with humans, but come back. I mean, that declaration is so powerful. I just want you to realize, though, that although he made that proclamation in the last couple of years, this journey to Mars did not just start with that proclamation. Historically, people have been engaged in wanting to go to Mars for so long, and in the 1950s, we had that great challenge, you know, everybody jockeying for position to be the first to get to space. In our case, you can see the rich history of our experiences as the United States. In the 60s, we had various Apollo and Gemini missions. We had, um, in the 70s, Viking, and then we had Skylab. And in the 90s, we had our opportunity to send our little rovers to space. And of course, we've been all along using the space shuttle from the 80s straight through. And then the International Space Station, in 2000. I mean, awesome chances to really be engaged. But one of the things that I must point out is that space travel and science communications and um, uh, spacecrafts and satellites that we launch have been almost routine, and so people don't pay as much attention. It's just knitted into the fiber of our everyday life. But in actuality, it isn't that easy. And I'm always remembered by that famous statement by President Kennedy, who said, we choose to go to the moon in this decade, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. It's not only hard, it's dangerous. And so I want to walk you through a little bit about why it's so hard and what it's like to think about as we plan for our journey to Mars. So NASA's coming up with this great integrated plan to capture the interest of the nation and the world. And so they have three different phases. As you can see, it's Earth aligned. We're dependent upon the, right in the Earth's shadow, we're going to go ahead and further do our science and learn to travel a little bit closer. And you can get back in a few days, I mean, in a few hours. And then we have this proving ground where we're going to validate the capabilities and we're going to move into deeper space. And the trip will take maybe several days to return. And then that last phase, where we're now Earth independent, will build up on the International Space Station as an outpost, potentially a launching pad. And then travel, though, would could take maybe several months to return. We've been doing some of these capabilities and preparing for missions back to the moon and to, to Mars. As you can see in Apollo, not much resolution. Well, instruments like the Lola instrument, which I worked on, actually is now able to create mapping in such detail, higher resolution, down to three centimeters, that we actually know where we're going to land with very much a lot of confidence. These laser LIDAR systems are fairly 
robust, and we're using this kind of technology and science on a regular basis. Then we need to go back to some of the things that we've been doing in the past of using rovers. And we're going to be dependent upon rovers in many ways. One, because of safety. It's always safer to send a rover. But we also want to be able to use these autonomous robots to actually build upon the capabilities, use them for science, astronaut assistance, which will be a little bit different than we've done in the past, and potentially manufacturing. These missions, the robotic precursive initiative, is so important. Just like in the Apollo days where we used Ranger and Surveyor, we were actually able to collect science on the surface of the moon to assist us for the Apollo missions. Stuff that we could only do right there on the surface. Well, similarly, we'll be doing that with our robotic precursor initiative in the 2020s to get the science and things and details that we need on the surface of Mars. These missions are going to prove to be so critical in our future, as well as the president's vision of getting humans to Mars in the 2030s. So let's consider, if I want to travel to Mars, really, how long does that take? So if you get the shortest distance between the two planets, that happens about every 26 months, it actually is about a nine-month trip. Well, you need to stay for a little while, because if you want to catch that short trip back, it comes about three to four months later. So, 993, 21 months to, to get to Mars and back in a fair amount of time. Then, if you look at our particular current technology, you really aren't going to get there much faster. I mean, it's just the state of the way it is. But I want to dig a little bit deeper. So, how are we going to get there? And, what are those challenges for the Space Launch System and our future crew vehicle, Orion? You're going to have to pack for two years. What does that mean? Look, I'm not just talking about going to San Francisco, right? You've got to take water, food. You've got to take medical supplies. You've got to be prepared for just about anything, and you're going to need some science instruments, maybe some manufacturing and engineering tools. Then you also need to think about radiation shielding because you use dense materials and it's pretty heavy. So all in all, if we consider a six-man crew, you're talking about three million pounds of supplies. I said that right. You heard that. Three million pounds of supplies for a two-year trip. Well, if you look there, you can see the shuttle only averaged about 54,000 pounds of launch capability. And to achieve that, to get 60 million, you know, this, this, this 3 million pounds, it's going to take us about 60 trips. We only averaged about 10 trips per year, so you're talking about six years to get all of our supplies into low Earth orbit. That's only 220 miles above Earth. So once you do that, I, I think it's going to be a little stale by the time we get back up there, right? <laughs> so what we could do is actually build a better launch system, but we're probably not going to be able to do it in one trip. So we're still going to have to have a capability to build in space, build in orbit. OK, so we get there. Well, to get out to Mars, we're still going to need a lot of fuel. OK, so how much fuel am I talking about? Well, for low Earth orbit, which is where the International Space Station is, that's 220 miles, as I said, and we need about 4.4 million pounds for the shuttle. That's how much it weighs when it launches. Three million pounds of that, believe it or not, is fuel. Yep, three million pounds. And then if you want to do a similar comparison, that's like a small car with a thousand pound tank on top. I don't know, I don't want to drive in a car like that. Not. But that's the way it is for the space shuttle. Now, if you want to travel to the moon, we actually use a larger vehicle called the Saturn V. And it has capabilities to travel to the moon. And it needs, you know, it'll carry about 100,000 pounds of payload to the moon. Now, the thing about it is it requires 6.5 million pounds when it takes off. And 6 million pounds of that is fuel. 90%. Can you imagine? Well, yeah. That's a big deal. Fuel costs money. 
It, it also weighs a lot, but that's what it's going to take. And guess what? We realize that we don't really have the capabilities to really get us to Mars with humans in that duration, so we're going to need something else. And so the plan is actually the new vehicle called the Space Launch System, and it will actually first take us to the moon, we'll prove it out, and then we'll take us to Mars. We also are developing a future crew vehicle called the Orion. And this Orion, believe it or not, is just a little bit larger than Apollo's mission because we need some more space for a longer flight, right? I wouldn't want to be all cramped up like this. Um, so we've been able to test it. And it's just done its first major mar um, launch capabilities where it was launched, orbited around the Earth twice, and then splashed back down. That was done in December of 2014, so we are continue to progress. One of the other things is we need to think about safety. Many people don't realize the effects of the body from space. Radiation plays a role, no gravity during that trip. So your muscles, your bones, your heart get weaker during the trip. You might get there and not even be able to stand in that gravitational environment again. So we have to have worry about those concerns. And then as you think about radiation, we realize that not only is the radiation bad in space, but it's actually not that great on the Mars surface as well. So, oh, and I want to throw one other thing out there you need to be concerned about safety. The huge dust storms on the Martian surface. Tough, tough. So we are continuing to use the International Space Station to learn about that and fill those gaps that we have in those, in those particular areas. Then we have this really cool mission called an asteroid redirect, and so we're going to grab an asteroid and move it into a different spot. So that's going to prove our capabilities of actually moving large objects and building and doing EVAs, and proving out EVAs, extravehicular activities, is when astronauts move around. Yeah, I'm throwing out some buzzwords there. But we'll be able to do something that's dangerous but prove it out in a lower air field. So to do all of this, Traveling in space is hard and it's dangerous, but we'll need people who dream, who dare, who are committed. We will go to Mars. Think about the International Space Station. It took so many people to achieve this goal. The International Space Station has had someone on it since 2000, and it took a partnership of 17 different countries. I say, hey, Bringing in different people with different ideas is a great thing. I believe that when diverse ideas collide, they spark innovation to solve hard problems like getting to Earth, I mean, getting to Mars. Many times the astronauts have looked back at the Earth and they've said, they see no boundaries, they see no borders, they see no walls. I want you to reach inside yourself and remove those boundaries. I want you to think about how to embrace the differences and the capabilities of each and every other person around you. If you look at this picture of the Star Trek crew, notice the diversity. That was Gene Roddenberry's vision of diversity. If we want people to move forward now and in the future, like our children, We've got to embrace diversity. I'm going to leave you with this thought. My favorite saying is shoot for the moon or Mars. And even if you miss, you'll still be among the stars. I always say peace. I believe in peace. Positive energy activates continuous elevation. But I'm going to throw this in there, too, for our Trekkies in the audience. <laughs> Live long and prosper. Thank you for having me today.